This is the second time you've been on. You were on really early days when we were useless. Our fifth. You were our fifth guest, and yeah, I really listened to it this morning. Yeah, as a when it was literally when, when it was just our address book of what mates can we possibly blag to be on our podcast, and it shows. I must say because. Um, we're not very good, I don't think. Not in that episode. No, not probably. in that episode. But if you want to know... I thought to you were okay. I didn't have a problem with it. Yeah, oh, but I think, I think we're just... We're spit slicker now. We, right. we, yeah, I, producer hoping. psychology. Yeah, I've <laughs> seen it all before. You know all your tricks, Trevor. Um, but we spoke a lot then about your upbringing and your you know first introduction into music and your and all this, the, a lot of the great stuff you did in the 70s. And I suppose... We'd and like working in a radiator hose company, there was quite, like, it was quite. And the tricks you used to do about trying to look busy. The John Bull Road company, yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's amazing when you work in a, in a kind of factory and you had the kind of job I had. I used to just pick up a piece of paper, say, see you in a minute, and I'd look important to go off. And I was, wasn't doing anything, you know. There was a band that worked down in the technical department. I used to go and talk to them. And I'd go off for an hour walking around the factory. I hated it. <laughs> Do you know, there was a thing I used to have for getting into gigs, which was you just pick up a box <laughs> and just go, excuse me, excuse yeah. me. Because if you've got a box, you're clearly meant to be taking it into the gig. <laughs> That's a great one. I don't though, think it would work now. But, but you know, so I suppose we, we were, were going to concentrate more today on, on, on the 80s and how, you know, to, as far as a lot of people are concerned, you sort of invented the sound of that decade. I mean, I, I have been aspirational... Every time well, I sit in a studio, there's always a little voice, and it says to me, what would, what would Trevor, Trevor do? do? No, and I've just remembered the thing I was climaxing to for the intro, oh. which is the whole thing of Trevor's records, which is that I've described your records as... They're, they're like Maxfield Parish paintings. Or something. Your records are a world that you want to step into and live in. <laughs> it's very nice of you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Is, it, it's quite, is it cheap? It's probably more expensive to make one of his records than a buying a house anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and a lifestyle for 70 years. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was a, a pretty exciting time at the start of the 80s because I had, uh, I don't know if you if if you ever tried uh, using a sequencer when they, f you know, the, I, I heard the very first ones were almost impossible, weren't they? I mean, I, you couldn't get a squeak out of the damn things. By the sort of 1982, I, I had a sequencer that I could work and I could lock that to drums and that that was an amazing thing because you think about it, you couldn't do that in the 70s, you know? You could actually lock fake drums and bass and it was a much better lock than MIDI as well because it was CV and gate, you know? So when you made the Buggles record, was it? Did you? Was that a real drummer was, on there? Yeah, that was a, uh, the Buggles record. We we couldn't get the only sequence on the on the whole Buggles record is a thing going e -e 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 on living in the plastic age, um, and that was just like a ruler that we'd recorded. Uh, we, we, we didn't know how to work in sequences, so it was all played. Do you know what's funny? Because I, I was listening to... I've, it's been a fantastic time, just refreshing my memory of, of your whole catalogue, but listening to the Buggles albums, and I can't remember what song it is, but what's interesting is one of them has an instrumental motif, which is so Joe Meek... And you suddenly realise that's kind of where you were coming from, <laughs> isn't it, in a way, because it was it was so pre-electronic, if you were, if you will. Yeah, he was he was amazing, Joe Meek. I mean, people forget about him because he shot people when he died. You know, when he killed himself. I know. Sh <laughs> shoot one landlady. <laughs> they never forgive you, do they? <laughs> he wouldn't let it lie. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess there is a bit of it. Yeah, minor chords and dramatic guitar parts, yeah. yeah but there's an actual organ pub, da, 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 which is quite tell story. Yeah. But I think that's what you were doing with that album. There was a pastiche in that album as well, wasn't there? There was this combination of, of, of modern, but it was a kind of... It was a sort of nostalgia for the future. Yes. You were inventing steampunk as well! <laughs> oh, my God! I don't know, I was trying to write songs about technology because I was a bit bored of songs about love. And since it was all a sort of techno-y thing, it was just anything I could think of to do with technology. Well, like, a oh, little sidebar, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but do you know that Mel Smith's favourite song that he always used to play whenever anyone went around the house was Elstree? Oh, right, well, it's funny. we played that on the American tour this year. Nah. Which, I'm, yeah. which is an homage to the to the studios, uh, to the right? studios. Yeah, it's funny when you're in like Denver saying this is about a little suburb, suburb of London called L Street. That's what I said, you know, uh -huh. that you'd never have heard of, but that's where they made Alfred Hitchcock films. No, but it was all the ITC. It was the Saint. It was Department S. It was yeah. Madeline Hopkirk. 
It was the same. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Just feel me and Trevor on, on, on this sort of triumvirate of people. There's you and there's Jeff Downs and there's, and there's Bruce Woolley. But Bruce ended up not being in the Buggles and doing his own version of, your, of a video Kill the Radio Star before you did your version. Well, well, you see, Bruce, we had a group, me, Jeffrey and Bruce and a drummer. I can't remember the drummer's name. And we were, we were playing... We weren't playing Video Kill the Radio Star, but we'd written some songs and we were playing them. And Bruce had written these other songs, which I thought were a bit cheesy, but they were sort of very commercial. Hey, baby, you look so fine in the candlelight or something. And we played on the demos of, of those songs. And suddenly, we, you know, we, we're rehearsing for months. This record label's playing. Suddenly Bruce tells me and Jeff, I've, I've, I've got a deal with uh, CBS Records. With Mike Hurst is signing me. He really likes, you know, all the demos of Candlelight and everything. And so I was like, so what are we going to do with the, the, all the other songs, you know, Video Killed the Radio Star and all those other songs? And, then, and Bruce said, well, they're not commercial. And I was like, well, I think they are. I Cut said, two. <laughs> yeah, if you're not going to do it, then I'm going to do it. Is that okay with you? And he said, yeah, fine. So that's when I called Jeff up and said, Jeff, we're going to do the Boggles, you and me. This will be different from before because instead of me hiring you, we'll both be in the band. And he said, who's singing? I said, me. <laughs> and he said, why don't we put your voice through a radio speaker? Oh, what a fucking great idea. Yeah, yeah it was his <laughs> idea, yeah. yeah. But, but, but uh, he, 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 Bruce went off and did that record. Did, well, did that piss you off His was a lot angrier, wasn't it, his version of it? Uh, it was he, his like was a sort of a group. He was trying to get a group Bruce off the ground. in the camera club. With the camera club, and it's much harder to launch a group. And, you know, our, I mean, our version was like... It made, made Abba look like Led Zeppelin, I thought, at the time, you know. <laughs> it was so poppy. Uh, Bruce's version was just, was a throwaway. It was done like a, th a throwaway. But I, I do remember one moment um, when we were working on our version and Bruce now was doing it live with his band, you know. He had... He had um, Nigel, the bass player, I Yeah, remember. He's some, he had a really yeah. good band. And I went to see them play it. And at the end, he sang that line, put the blame on VCR. Oh, Wow. He never told me about that line. I wrote most of the other lyrics, but so uh, <laughs> I wrote it down oh, oh, <laughs> straight oh, on our version. <laughs> Did you learn anything from producing that? Do you think that that put you in good stead for your future? Yeah, I learned that if you do a good demo, you better copy it absolutely exactly. You know, otherwise your goose is cooked. We made a great demo of it that uh, that we couldn't use because it belonged to Tina Charles. And to use it, we would have had to sign a contract with why, her. Why did it belong to Tina Charles? Because she financed the yes, recording session. Uh, she uh, was your girlfriend. I was, time. no, not at that point. She was long since stopped being my girlfriend. She was married. But she was still paying for your demos, all well, right? Well, she, you see... <laughs> <laughs> Interesting arrangement. I'd been no. <laughs> Tina was great. And I'm not going to say anything bad about Tina. She, she was so funny. Um, and I was her MD for for a long time I learned a lot from and I was also the tour manager what a mug I was you know the, uh, the first tour when I uh, when we had to do the accounts at the end I had to turn over like 50 quid I'd people had had money and it had gone and I hadn't taken a you know record of it you know so for, from then on anybody wanted hookers at 3 o'clock in the morning and wanted a you know advance of $100 I'd make them sign a book no, no one told me about all that uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was working Sorry, with... Sorry, can I say, Tina Charles' band sound pretty wild. <laughs> well, it could, it could be fun to... I, I remember we, we, we did a tour in Israel once, and uh, right at the end of it, we were all celebrating up in the uh, in um, some big hotel, and Tina and her husband were getting quite drunk. And because I'd been Tina's boyfriend, I always had a sort of fairly realistic idea of what was going on, you know. <laughs> and at a certain point in the evening, Tina said, Joe, here's a carrier bag. Take it back to London. So I said, what's in it, Tina? Yeah, look. So I opened it up. It's full of money. So I said, how much is in here, Tina? I don't know. I said, right. <laughs> I went off to my hotel room and counted it. And made out a sheet, and I came. It was twenty nine thousand pounds in cash. 
and which I in made those it, days, I mean, which in those days, still in these days, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a shitload of money. And uh, I made a sign for it, and I came back through the customs with it, and I didn't know it was smuggling money, wow. you know. So that was Tina. She was a bit wacko, and she <laughs> she had this idea that she wanted to invest in the music business a, a bit. And I said, well, I've got a project for you, the Buggles. <laughs> she said, what's that? And I explained, it's this song we've got, you know. And then she said, who's singing? And I said, mm-hmm. uh, Bruce Woolley, I think, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> of course it wasn't, it was me, but there you go. Was um, <laughs> was we, your dream at that point then to, to, to keep the Buggles going and being a, being a, a famous group that just kept on making hit, hit albums or did did you always hanker after being a producer well, well, well i was really a, uh, jeff and i made so many records i used to produce songwriters for for publishers you know and and do I, those tapes exist by the way do you still have some of them well, I've, got, I've got a few are, bits are, are, are there sort of like records that we'd know that you've did that? no no there'd be things like a guy called john howard i did quite a few tracks with him uh, there's a list. I did 48 different songs the year before I had a hit with video. And I made two and a half thousand quid I had it in my diary. Mm. Um, because I always used to spend... The tour accounting really came in handy, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> I didn't pay any tax, but... Uh, yeah, so, so... I don't know if there's a statute of limitations on that. So to <laughs> oh, no, I don't. Well, as soon as I had a hit, it all had to be cleared up. You know, I went through like two or three years where I never answered the door, you know, those times. <laughs> <laughs> Not even to the paper boy. <laughs> I suppose I'm getting around to you doing Dollar, really, which is... Right. Which was your big... I, I don't know, I consider that as your breakthrough as a producer. I mean, certainly I became aware of it and he- hearing those records and thinking, wow, the production on that, it's just so different. Yeah. Well, that was my late wife. She, she, she you know, when, when I split up with my partner... I said, well, at least you can manage me now. And she said, if I'm going to manage you, I think you should be a producer. And she said, I'll get you somebody really good to produce. And then she came with Dollar. Now, obviously, I was a little bit shocked, but so I was like, Dollar? You know, I, I did three nights at Madison Square Garden. So you'd already been in Yes. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah, that course, happen- yeah. How had that happened? Because you didn't yes. really have an <laughs> obvious track record for Yes. Did no, I bend? didn't. Um, no, you're right. Uh, the Yes thing happened purely because... The Buggles ended up with a manager who was the same manager as Yes. And that was partly because Brian, my, uh, Brian, Lane, Brian Lane. Because my late wife had worked with him with a band uh, because her brother, John, who's, who, who isn't in the business anymore, uh, had produced uh, the first Foreigner album uh, along with Gary Lyons. And he was producing another band and they were managed by Brian Lane. And somehow, so we got friendly with Brian Lane and then we needed a manager. We thought, why not Brian Lane? You know, we were in the early days where, you know, with Brian Lane, limos seemed to turn up. And we thought limos <laughs> were like part of the whole thing. It's when you get the bill, right? At the end of the month, you realise, fuck me. Look the cost of these limos. I thought they were free. <laughs> <laughs> like, is anything free? Uh, and we met, um, so I knew that I was going to meet Chris Squire at some point if we had Brian Lane. Are you a big fan of Yes? Obviously. I was a big fan of Yes, yeah. So we met Chris Squire, and uh, he invited us down to his house down in Virginia Water, and we went down one evening. Uh, what was funny was when we went down there, his kids were waiting at the door to get our autographs because we were the Buggles <laughs> at the time, you see. And Chris really liked one of the songs on the album called Living in the Plastic Age. He just liked the whole sound of it. And we were at his place and we were talking and he was, you know, it was an amazing house, you know, had a minstrel gallery. Chris's well, wife. Of course it did. Chris's <laughs> wife had hair down to her knees. It's, com- it's compulsory you know, for any uh, progger, isn't it? It, it a was minstrel serious, gallery. P- serious progsville. <laughs> and, uh, and I said to him, I don't suppose you're looking for any songs for Yes, because I've got a song for Yes. <laughs> and he said, oh, play it to me. So I picked up a guitar and I played, you know... 45 uh, minutes later. Along the edge. <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> no, at this point it was fairly short. And I played him a bit of this song and sang it and he said, the line, God, you sound a little bit like John Anderson. And from that moment... And then he said, why don't you come down and rehearse this song with the band? 
And I said, will John be there? Shall I show it to him? And he went, no, John won't be there. Uh, but you should come down, you know. I was very nervous going down and hearing your favourite band in a rehearsal room and then getting your daft little song, you know, and seeing what they're going to do with it. That was a, quite an experience anyway. I ended up joining the band. Of course, I discovered that they'd fallen out with John Anderson over money and, and they'd parted company and they had a tour booked in America and they didn't want to cancel it, so they needed somebody. So it was drama. And the album was called Sounds drama. Sounds like yeah. it all round. Yes. It what, was, was. what was the name of the song? Fly... Uh, Fly, Fly From Here wasn't even on drama. The song that oh. I sang to Chris was, we did it 12 years later, 12, actually longer than that later. Oh, 20, yes, 30 of years later. And, and it must be, so you were straight out onto this mass arena tour, and are you still silver suit and the big glasses? No, by this point, I've, I've changed my outfit a little bit, obviously for yes. <laughs> Figuring that the silver jacket... Silver I had a black, I had a black, uh, black jacket with Hollywood on the back and a pair of spandex trousers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a pretty, it's pretty uh, funny. What did the, what did the yes uh, folk think? Well, the first gig was Maple Leaf Gardens Toronto, you know it, don't you? Oh my you? God, yeah. It's, it's pretty big, isn't it? That's a pretty big gig, yeah. And the night before... We had two and a half weeks of rehearsal and we never got from one end of the set to the other. Fuck. <laughs> Every fucking night something broke down. It was Chris Squire's bass pedals. And I, I remember at a certain point in the rehearsals, a guy called Claude Johnson Taylor, who was uh, Steve Howe's roadie, got on the mic and said, said, Chris Squire, you need to be fired from this band. You're fucking about. You're fucking dragging this band down. <laughs> the whole bit started shouting at Chris. And I remember Chris was working on his bass pedals. He turned around and he said, Steve, control your roadie. <laughs> <laughs> So I put Igor back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we never got through the set. And, uh, and the night before the first show, uh, uh, I went to see Chuck Berry with the woman who was running the tour. And Chuck Berry was playing in a stadium. And we went in and it was, uh, it, it was somewhere in Toronto. And I said to her, this is bigger than the Maple Leaf Gardens, isn't it? She said, oh, no, Maple Leaf Gardens, three times the size of here. The fuck? <laughs> We're on tomorrow night, you know? Yeah, because how much, how, well, all your live work till then had been, been, bass, player. been bass player and a dance band. How did you so get on? How did I get on? Well, funny enough, at the start, it wasn't too bad because uh, I, I, I was fresh. And, you know, on the, fir you know, the first night, I, like 10, 20 minutes before we went on, I said to Chris, so you, you do the talk, you're doing the talking. And he went, no, singer does the talking. <laughs> I was like, me? <laughs> I was, fuck off, I'm not going to do the talking. <laughs> he said, you'll have to, because I'm not going to talk. And I, <laughs> Can I do the receipts <laughs> instead? I could hear my... <laughs> I can hear my <laughs> voice on the on the opening show. I'm going, this is a song called Temple of Fugit. I'm, I'm fat, a bit terrified. <laughs> but, and the first night, as it got going, I thought, you know, it's funny. There's not really that much difference between Hammersmith Palais and no. the Leaf Gardens Toronto. It's a stage. You I know. mean, honestly, it's yeah, it, to be keep honest, telling yourself it, it, <laughs> is, it is easier playing a a bigger place than a smaller place because you can't see the whites of their eyes yeah. most people you know 50,000 people you don't know is easier than 50 people you do yeah no it's true yeah it's very true but, but let's go so production now yeah, it's right, so yeah. Jill wanted you to go into that into that world and and Dollar obviously became almost like a calling card for you didn't it was did yeah. you did you find because that was just you wasn't it basically doing that yeah, you, was, you wrote was, the, the yeah, four, I made the, the records, four songs yeah. which is basically which is in a way it's quite funny that there's sort of parallels with the Barbie movie or something isn't it you just invented this world and this story yeah I, I got totally into the world of Dollar the little techno world with the two little characters in it but also the sort of the, just the sound effects this that you you seem to arrange in this kind of you know it wasn't just put the cello there it was these kind of th th oh no it was very very specific like on mirror on mirror and mirror it, you know uh, dollar was at the start it was pre-fairlight there's a bit where it goes do, 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 and then there's a big crash of a champagne bottle well that's me with with a, a big spanner 
and the tarpaulin and bottles and smashing it straight onto the, you know what I mean, straight onto mm-hmm. the tape. You didn't have a sample and you wow. couldn't fly it. So you actually had to do it. Um, but what was your inspiration for the madness of that sort of stuff? Well, yeah. I, I didn't think I was mad. I was just being visual, you know. But yeah. I thought Dollar would jump, like, popping out of a champagne bottle, you know, yeah. like uh, of a cork. And the record sort of pops out of a bottle, you know, kind of thing. Because there's a thing that comes, which has become very much a trademark of yours, I say, which is that thing of the sudden event. Yeah. The sudden unexpected event, which yeah. just happened, you know, ding, 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 yeah. ding you know. Was that a sort of was that a sort of sample world that you were entering into, or was that that was something that was always in your head, giving people sort of ear candy? Well, I didn't come from a background of playing in a band for years where you can get away with being dull, you know. <laughs> I came from a world where you only had you know thirty seconds to grab them, you know, and so I thought like that. Mm. I mean, I have to say, after yes, I. I kind of opened things out a bit. I wasn't uh, quite so tied to that short format, but uh, I, I was all, I was always thinking about singles because I thought, what's you know what's the what's the point in um, having a producer unless they can give you a hit record? You might yeah. as well do it yourself, or oh, unless they can produce it. So singles are always much more pressured than album tracks. How know? did ABC come your way? Was it through that track? It was no Jill, songs. wasn't it, again? Uh, it was Jill. Jill Jill spotted them, and she thought I would be, it would be a good fit. And uh, and then I met them, and, you know, they were bright kids from, from Sheffield. They all went to university. They were funny, and they were full of ideas, you know? But also, the, the, but for, for them, because of your perception, apart from the yes thing, which probably wouldn't mean much to ABC, is... Because they're obviously coming from a cooler, sort of almost neuromantic electro thing. And, yeah. And, you know, you, they must have think, thought, well, he's this big pop guy. Did, was there a bridge you had to cross with them? Well, the, yes and no. I mean, the, the, the thing was, when, when we first met, I had no idea that I was the 14th producer. I thought I was, <laughs> I thought I was wow. checking them out to see if I wanted to work with them. You know what I mean? I wasn't thinking like that. And they had a magazine, a songwriting magazine, and it had a sort of cartoon of a Hoagy Carmichael-like character at the piano with a cigarette writing songs. And they were really, they, they showed me a couple of magazines. And I said, oh, you're in the magazines? Check out my magazines. And I had, like, lots of wrestling magazines. I used to really like, you know, wrestling. Okay. Mick McManus? <laughs> no, American wrestlers. You oh. know, the guys that... Uh, Don't be ridiculous. American wrestlers. <laughs> the guys okay. that have sort of flames shooting from their cod pieces and wow. stuff like that. Because the magazines are just hilarious to read, you know. Like tattoo magazines are funny magazines to read, you know. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, like them. I, I think so, you're on the wrong podcast, Trevor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I whipped out my wrestling well, so magazine. We haven't been briefed, clearly, <laughs> have we? My notes have nothing. And they were into it. They, I remember they said to me, if you produce us, you'll be the most fashionable producer in the world because we're the most fashionable band in the world. But I think what you're, you were, where you kind of saw eye to eye is that Martin wrote very cinematic lyrics, almost film noir lyrics. Yeah. And, and so what you offered them was a cinematic production. And, and I guess your relationship with Anne Dudley was important at that point. Yeah, because Anne, Anne was uh, really an important part of that. But, you know, there was a funny moment on that album that, that involved you, even though you weren't there, which was... Um, remember, while I was actually working on that album, I I worked on Instinction yeah. for you. And they were a bit pissed off with me about that, right? What do you do in working with Spandau Ballet? You know, I was like, well, I like Spandau Ballet. If I would work with them if I want to, I would... Wanted to fix up a track for them, right? Hmm. Spanned our fucking ballet, right? <laughs> and we were we were working one night on one of the tracks. I can't remember what it was. Forever Together. And JJ, the, the, the Fairlight guy, had a sample of a guitar. And he was trying to play like a heavy metal guitar. He was trying to play it over the track. It didn't sound very good. And he said, no, nah, that's not working. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, JJ, just leave it. Just leave it. I said, Gary, just leave it. Just for a minute or two. Just till tomorrow. And the next day, we, we put the track up. Mark White, the guitar player, came in. And we're playing the track back. And this bit of guitar played. So what's, what the fuck's that? And I said, oh, uh, 
Gary was over last night. <laughs> Gary <laughs> Kemp. And he went, Gary Kemp was here. I said, yeah, he came down. He was hanging. And he heard this chat and he said, how about I put a bit of guitar on it? <laughs> <laughs> and of course he said, you fucking lad. Gary Kemp play on our track. Of course, in the end, I He loves tell. wrestling magazines. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in those days, we all hated each other. Know, there was a lot so of competition. Funny, all was band, but that's with all movers, all bands. All, yeah. Everyone hates each other. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was, was it... Um, was it Malcolm next, or, or was it Frankie? It was Malcolm next. I think. It was Malcolm next, yeah. Which is, uh, which is a really, it was a drug. So I, I, I was listening to that album earlier, but also I looked at the, um, looked at the video on YouTube of Duck Rock, yeah. and all the comments underneath of all these people who are now sort of in their fifties, and it's just saying how important yeah. that record was because we were all into hip hop and stuff, and stuff yeah. but of course no one else knew about it outside of West Eleven, as far as I'm concerned. Oh. Um, and it was, and you know, the world famous Supreme Team and all that. It was yeah, that I know, it really was a, did break it. To was the it world. was it an amaze, a, a major moment for you when Malcolm came to you? And and, and you did did you find that his ideas were triggering anything that you? Yeah, you're kidding. Do? He played me. He you know he told me that they scratched records in Amer in America. And somebody says, what? you know what? And then I heard it. God, I never heard that before. And you know uh, he had this tape of the world's famous Supreme Team. And he said, you know, in, in New York, like, all the black kids really like Depeche Mode. I thought, what? You know what I mean? It just didn't... I thought... I, Africa I, Bambata. Yeah, but, but, you know, then I went over there with him and I met Africa Bambata. I had a very brief conversation with him. Um, <laughs> he was introduced and, you know, he's, he was a fairly uh, interesting-looking individual. And I said, who's your favourite band? And he said, the Guess Who... I was like, the Guess Who? That's a Canadian band. They turned into Buckman Turner Overdrive. You like them? And he said, yeah, I've got a live album. Wow. It's got the best drum breaks on it. And then I realised, oh, ah, right. he's just scratching the drum breaks, you know. You had to be there. It was a great time, you know. And I came back to England. And, you know, and, and Malcolm had this daft idea. He wanted to release, you know, Buffalo Girls. We'd done it, we'd recorded it down in Tennessee, and it was awful. It was, you know, you know first buffalo, get yeah, all around the outside, you know, with a, just like a country thing. I mean, and I, I felt so embarrassed by it, you know. I didn't know what to do about it. And, and one dinner time, he was talking about, I want to make a rapping scratching record called E.T. Come Home. And I said... <laughs> Of course he did. <laughs> I said, why don't we do Buffalo Girls as a rap and scratching record? And he went, yeah. I thought, God, this could be it. I could get myself off the hook. Because I was dreading coming back to England and playing the record label. Right. The sort of country and right. Western. I mean, what could you, you know what I mean? Because the beauty of that album and those tracks is all the samples, the radio stuff that you have talking. I mean, where did you get those? Were they, were they made new or were they literally... That, that was from the world's famous Supreme Team. You know, we flew them over. Then we had to get them decks. And then they weren't very keen. They hated Radio 1. Like, fucking Radio 1, you know. One minute it's this and next minute it's it's terrible. They, they couldn't get their heads into it. And uh, I tried to explain the Fairlight to them, but they didn't get it. But um, I had a drum machine and I said, what's your favourite beat? So about four hours later, we finally got do 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 do, and you know I just I had a Oberheim, so I went boom, 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 or something like that, you know, and just made a groove. Then I gave them these these records, and they started to scratch them over it, and and that's it all came out because it was so some of it was so good. They would say, "Hey man, this stuff's fresh, you know, it's fresh." And sometimes I didn't understand what they were talking about, but <laughs> they would say they would say fresh. Uh, and then and then I said to them, you know, you gotta you gotta um, we gotta wrap this Buffalo Girls thing. They went what? I said, look, here are the lyrics. And they looked at it and they went, nah, no, we're not wrapping this. Well, I said, why not? <coughs> they said you can't wrap this. This is a clan, Ku Klux Klan. I was like, no, no, it's not. It's just a country dance. And I said, look, I'll show you. And I had the drum track, you know, doo doo, ch, doo doo. And I went out in the studio and I went, you know, first Buffalo Girl go round the outside, round the outside, and rapped for a bit. And then I looked in the control room, I couldn't see them. And <laughs> I thought, oh God, they've gone. 
So <laughs> I, I went back in the control room. They hadn't gone. They were both weeping with laughter <laughs> and lying on the floor. And they got up. They were like, hey, Trev, man, we never knew you could rap. <laughs> They thought it was the funniest thing ever. Well, yeah, but in the end, I had a good time with them, you know. they I mean, poor old Malcolm didn't have any kind of a sense of rhythm. And we tried we tried everything. You know, we would try stuff, you know. They would start it off, we would have a beat, and they would say, hey, we're flying over Texas with our man Malcolm McLaren. And, and some music, and Anne would play some music, and then Malcolm would go, oh yeah, we do it, whatever. And they'd go, fuck, man. Malcolm, <laughs> you are the biggest vibe killer. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you know, but, but in the end, you know, where I, he, he, was, he was a real sweetheart. I said to him, give me a day or two. Just give me two days with all this stuff, and I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll make the record. And I, I, I thought I'll do it like an abstract painting of a single, you know, have all the yeah. all the sort of uh, the bits happening at the right time, but they'll all be the wrong bits, kind of thing, you know. Ah, like a cubist <laughs> kind of look. Yeah. yeah, and it worked. But yeah, but then, uh, but then there's the African stuff. Yeah, you went to Africa and, and the you? adventures there. That sounds like really, really nuts. Well, being stuck in a studio for 20 nights in a row with 19 people because it was apartheid, nobody could go out. And I had like an assortment of Kosas and uh, Zulus and like four or five Zulu ladies who are the most amazing singers. And we were just all in the studio all night together. You know, I used to, uh, if you did a good overdub, I'd roll you a joint specially, you know. Um... I sent them out, I, I, you know, first first evening when I was there. I said, I don't suppose you could get me any grass, could you? There's nobody from the sea I did. <laughs> and uh, I gave him $20, and they said, this is a lot of money. The next day they came in, they had a carrier bag full of weed. Oh, God, <laughs> I fucking go to prison for this, you know? So I gave most of it back Getting to Getting on the plane with another carrier bag. <laughs> <laughs> So we, so we, it, we, we, it was very congenial. We, we were there from eight, eight in the evening to eight in the morning for 19 nights. And we did a load of really good stuff. They do this a double dodge, living on the road in Soweto, all kinds of things. Did, that, did you get influenced, did the go-go stuff that you later did on with Slaves of the Rhythm, did that sort of come out of your And it was trip? all township stuff. These guys could play that, you know, do, 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 do. Do, 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 High life, do, do, is that? Do, 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 you know that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They High could life, just yeah. turn it on and play it for hours. And Malcolm was writing songs over it, you know, weird songs. Because I was thinking with Slave to the Rhythm that you, you, yeah. it was when you were working on that. I know we jumped Frankie there, but I mean, but you, you, well, Go Go was the Go Go was the. But it was a really brief fashion thing. I mean, I loved it. Reds and the Boys and all those. Where bands. did it but come it, from? That it Washington. came from Washington, Washington yeah. DC. It was a really specific little club scene. It was basically P Funk, wasn't it? But it was just that yeah. one twelve eight groove is what it was. And there yeah. was this, this scene that it was just a really small. It was just the Island Records. Chuck jumped, Brown, the Soul Searchers, <laughs> yeah. somebody Washington. And, and who was the guy who had the white? Uh, who I loved because he had white Ray Bands, which I thought was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. It was, one, it was on a Go Go compilation I had. Oh, but it, I, but um, because I think you, you know you you from what I re- gather you you had the song slate to the rhythm, but it was it you couldn't quite get a handle on how to do it, and Go Go was your in. But yeah, it took it you was, a while it, to it, get there. It was very straight. Think about Go 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 concerts because I went to two. I, I saw EU. You know, remember Experience oh, Unlimited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were really good. The music never stopped. That was the, the point. Yeah, the, the whole band point is started. The group, yeah, and then when the band got to the end of its set. <coughs> <coughs> the drummer would keep going and the next band would take over and wow. the, the show would so go on. So it was kind of like a live answer to hip hop, wasn't it? In, <coughs> it was, yeah. It was, you know. it was, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I thought, I'm, you know, I'm probably only going to do one record with Grace Jones. I wanted to do something, you know, I wanted it to be good because, I mean, you think about her stuff, think about yeah. my Jamaican guy and things like that. Like Vion Rose and all that. Yeah, like Vion Rose, fucking great tracks and I didn't want mine... Mine to be the dismal one that everybody skipped. <laughs> and uh, and the first version we did of it, I didn't like much. And uh, Was it was it written for her? No, it was actually... With Bruce. Uh, uh, Bruce Bruce wrote it with, with yeah. a guy called Simon Darlow. I wrote a bit of it. Uh, but then... Fantastic set of chords. Marcus. It's a fantastic. But Bruce yeah, came up with those chords yeah. m- much later in the day. He came up with those chords. Why? Because everybody thought I was mad with this go-go rhythm idea. And... It, you know, 
I had all these guys and I tried to teach them an arrangement. And I realized the only arrangement that they knew was start and stop, right? <laughs> Anything that happened in between just fucking happened. That was it. Uh, and the idea, well, you go here, there, oh boy. <laughs> you know, nobody seemed to be able to get a handle on the arrangement at all. And, you know, we were going around in circles and trying to get them to change and everything. But there was one bit of drumming that the guy did when they were setting up. And was I that got, William Juju House? Yeah, Juju. He was brilliant. I got it on my... You know when you used to have those little cassette players with a speaker in them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. had one of those. And I had his, uh, this one bit where he's warming up and I kept saying to Steve, I love this. This with this. Why don't we just use this? Let's send them all home. And we'll use, we'll do something with this, which is kind of what we did. Um, when did those chords come about? Because well, that was, you said that was a lot later, because that really No, that, that was on the same day that I had that thing. Bruce suddenly started to play those chords, and we were like, God, I like that. You know, that could really work. And we had to, we were staying in the Park Meridian. They kicked us out of the studio. We went back to the Park Meridian, carrying loads of gear, you know, like Carry speakers, <laughs> mixer, <laughs> drum machine. Everyone looking at us very suspiciously and set them up in my room and finished, it, finished off the idea for the song. Wow. And then invited Chris Blackwell around to play it to him. He was horrified. Was Grace, <laughs> was Grace singing on it, by the way? No. At this point, it was just sort of experimental, you know? But I was very enthusiastic about it. Uh, I think, think Chris <laughs> wasn't sure, you know. <laughs> and then we spent two days making the drum track. I, I'm yeah. more, I'm, what was Grace like to work with? Because I would be quite late. terrified, I think. She was late. Oh, yeah. We've not asked late. her on the podcast, have we? <laughs> <laughs> you well, ask! Should, <laughs> you <laughs> exactly. Oh, um, you should get Grace on. She's a good laugh. On, yeah. She's a really good laugh. She's funny. Uh, Stay at arm's length, obviously. Not she... really. No, she was. She was really nice. Last time I saw, I saw her, I saw her actually in the in the Nicholas the, the the wine shop on Holland Park Avenue, and she was speaking fluent French to the guy behind the counter. Mm. Are you sure? What? <laughs> 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 I, w I was trying to persuade her to come down the studio I called her up a couple of times and and she said um, oh I'm going through a terrible terrible time I just set fire to all my boyfriend's clothes and I was like really <laughs> yes they're all burning it's going to be real trouble and I was like that was Dolph what's his face Dolph Lundgren yeah, yeah, yeah. Dolph oh my Lundgren God. yeah those are big clothes. But did she get? <laughs> did she get this? This, this was a massive, expansive record with one song. Really, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. It but was when, when, so when she finally came down to the studio, it was a Sunday in New York. It was the power station. Remember the power station? Ah, uh, of course, I remember. And the power uh, yeah, she came down on the Sunday, and uh, we played her the track. I was wondering how she was going to take take to it, but she got it straight away. She said, "Oh, I get the idea." She said, "It's the end of the day, and I'm tired." Ah, she sat down and Bruce started to feed her the lines. Did she say it? You know, work all day yeah, as men who know. Boy, we were thrilled. It sounded great, you know. But w and when did the idea? When did it become an album? Oh, that was that was when real insanity started to creep in. Uh, because she didn't really do anything other than that, did she? You basically just had to have, song? Get, have a load of people talking about uh, her. Well, we, yeah, we did. We did a couple of other versions because Dave Gilmore plays yeah, in one version. I listened. For, I listened for the. You actually mentioned that in the last one. And I listened for that in the fashion show one, which, by the way, has some fabulous fretless bass on it. Is that you? Yeah, no, it's a Sinclair. I wish I could oh, say wow. it was it's a Sinclair. Okay. But uh, no, but there's another lead guitarist on it because I was thinking cause, Steve Lipson and him. There you go, because I think they started it. thinking, that's not David. And then suddenly there's this, and it's like, oh, there he is. There's my yeah. boy. Yeah. That was, <laughs> when, and it's funny thing about David, when he first played on it, I, I said, Dave, you know, that, that was great, but he didn't play a single right note. And I've <laughs> realised why, because it's an E flat. <laughs> <laughs> so he tuned his guitar down, yeah. uh, and things got better, you know. <laughs> we were all in E, and then everything was fine. Let's talk about Frankie. Cause, exactly. Because, yes. I mean, oh. you know, there, there wasn't a musician in, a, in the 80s who wasn't jealous and envious of those records. Okay, I've got, I want to tell a story, which is, I want to tell a story, which is um, the first, when I was on the Tube, 
Uh, I told you not to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> Is this with Ice House? With Ice House, yeah. And that was the week that Frankie were on it as an unsigned, undiscovered band. Wow. And we were told by our management that... Um, that you were going to be watching the show with a view to maybe producing Ice House. But I'm wondering if they just told us that afterwards. That's the first... Mix. That <coughs> face of Trevor's just said that's the first he's heard of it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Do you know what? That might be true. Oh! Ah. That might be true. That Why didn't you produce Ice House? <laughs> I, I don't know. But I, I think... Um, because when, when I actually watched that show, I was really pissed off with Yes, because Chris Squire had been six hours late at a studio that was costing £150 an hour. And oh, so I'll show you, I'll produce Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we missed Owner of a Lonely Heart, we'll get to Owner of a Lonely Heart. So I was, I was pretty uh, angry with him at the time, and I kind of wasn't speaking, I was sitting in the corner. And uh, that's the first time I saw them. And then... Uh, uh, yeah, at the time, you know, it wasn't a great version of Relax. But it no, was, it was more of a standard it was, fun yeah. workout, wasn't it? And then I heard, uh, I heard them on the ra on Radio 1. They'd done a John Peel session. Right. And I heard it again on, you know, I heard <laughs> it. And, you know, when you hear something a second time, I thought, I could do something with that. I really could do something with that. Was that Paul Morley helping you to reach out or persuading you? No, Paul Morley didn't want to sign them. He hated the idea because wow. I went in uh, after I heard it on the radio on Kid Jensen's show. I went in the next morning. I said, I want to sign Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I don't care what it costs. God, I just think those t shirts could have been Ice House say, I'm uh, the unemployed. What was it that, that you heard in that? I don't know. I, I, mean, I mean, I heard Holly's voice, and Holly's got a, you know, he's yeah. still got a good voice. He had a great voice back then. And uh, something about the track. I mean, the funny thing is, when I actually came to do the track, I hadn't thought about it much, and suddenly I had to deal with it. I thought, God, how much, there's not really a whole lot there. <laughs> what you was your key in? What was the moment you thought, I've got this track now? Well, it was on the fourth version, when I... Uh, it was a late night, wasn't it? Yeah, sort of? well, no, it was one of those kind of things that started in the afternoon. Uh, the band had gone home to, to get their... Uh, they got home to get their dole money, because they had to go every week, and uh, <laughs> and so Shut there was just really. me, Lippo, and Andy Richards, and whatever in the control room, and somebody brought over some really powerful um, Nepalese temple ball stuff, and um, I was in the control room listening to the version that we were working on, which was the Frankies playing it, and I was hating it, you know, you know when you're like fuck. We spent two weeks on this. I'm so sick of this. If I could go, if I could leave it, I'd go, but it's on my record label. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> uh, you know, I was sort of thinking like that. So I thought, man, maybe try some of this Nepalese temple ball. Maybe this will solve the problem. <laughs> so I had some, and uh, I got everybody else to have some. And, I, and then I decided that we needed to wipe the tape, that it was absolute rubbish. And you should have all told me we've been flogging a dead horse. This is crap. We're not getting anywhere with it. You know, it's hopeless. And uh, I've been beaten. That's it. I'm going to have to give up. Uh, and then I thought, but what about that thing we did in the rehearsal room? The thing where we were running the Fairlight with the, the Lynn. Maybe we can do something with that. And we started, and like five hours later, we had the record. They had a great team of people. Lipson was brilliant, you know. So it was the bass and the... Dr and the yeah, we, we, we started off, we had a piano going, gung, 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 eights, and a, and a bass guitar going, gung, 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 gung. But the real key to it was switching the patterns on the Lynn. You go from four on the floor... You know, to to that all of that percussion. Do, do. And that was a great moment when I first did that. I was like, "Wow, that's great." We do that when Relax comes in, and you know, we were st do, it started to go. You know, but the really radical thing about that, I mean, the, is, is that there's no backbeat. There's no, no snare. Know. There's no two and four. That was, but no. and I remember a friend of mine, a drummer at the time, saying, "No, no, no. What make that makes it incredibly powerful because it's like an African thing where it becomes that relentless beat." It's not broken up by a two and a four. No, 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 no you're right. It, 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 exactly. I, I always thought it was a bit like a square dance. Um, you know, like Boris dancing in a yeah. sort of funny kind of way. Well, Buffalo Girls, you keep going back to it. No. <laughs> how, did, how did the band take it when you said, sorry, lads, it, it, you're not actually going to be on it apart oh. from Holly? Well, I didn't say it like that because 
all of this happened on a Tuesday. (laughs) All of this happened on a Tuesday, and, you know, it was one of those days where, you know, I mean, the the Nepalese temple ball was definitely getting smaller. (laughs) And... uh, and more and more ideas were flowing. And of course, the next thing was, oh God, why do we have to have that five fucking tones blue scale? I loathe, you, you know, that bloody awful thing. Why don't we use real minor chords, you know? And of course, Andy Richards was clever because he, instead of playing an E minor, he played a G6, you know? But I, I don't, you said that in your book. Yeah. Uh, and that puzzles, I, I can't see what the big difference is. Well, it's E minor, it makes it E minor seventh. Yeah. You know? But, the but with a G. Is like a G, a G six is, is, is got a, you know, G, B, D, and E. No, I know what it is. I, yeah. I know what it is, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of, the D makes it a, makes it a makes sort it a of seven, seventh. Yeah. And because you're not playing the root in the chord, it gives it a, that funny sound, you know, that. Well, I hope your relationship hasn't diminished no, after no, this. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Bass players always have to if know. Everything's been augmented. Ah. <laughs> Bass players always have to know what the chords are doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, 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 but just wondering what those what those boys from Liverpool came. Why aren't I on it? You know, or well, didn't it matter to them? They just saw that this was a great. Well, sound. they sang on it a bit, you know, relax and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. well, and they jump into the swimming pool. They in the jump into the of swimming it. pool, yeah. <laughs> was, that, was that actually a sort of a sort of stop to them? Well, you do jump into the swimming pool at the beginning of it. <laughs> well, it was at the end actually? Do you well, get that PPL was for jumping into a swimming pool. That right? was the only thing we used for the first session. Them jumping in the swimming pool. Yeah, the, the band really liked the record, and just going back t- to it, it would have been so easy to have to have put pad on the drums on it, you know, and to yeah. put mark on the bass. Because it was nothing complicated. In fact, it was easier than their version to play. But I was so, I, you know, I was. It was at the end of it. I'd, I, I was. I'd had enough. You know what I mean? But I felt like you found a sound that represented ZTT and you, and it wasn't just about the band. This was something almost career changing, wasn't it? Oh, for them, and well, for you as well. Well, you know? to a point. But don't forget, don't forget, Relax didn't come out and zoom up the charts. Ah. Came out and languished. <coughs> I was in America working on Foreigner, and it was just, it got terrible reviews. Um, NME said it was another awful dance record or something like that. And I mean, I, I, I started to get quite depressed about it. It was only Steve Lipson who said, they're wrong, it's a classic. And I thought, well, he's a bit miserable, so normally, so he must be right, maybe, you know. Um, and when I came back from America, uh, it dropped from 53 to 54. And I have to say it in the book. Oh. And everyone was like, well, it was a good try, you know. Uh, and then uh, Dave Robinson and Jill, got, they, we got them on, uh, on back on the tube. You know, apropos right. nothing. Whole, yeah. It went up to number 32. And then... Uh, then we got Top of the Pops, and it just went through the roof. When I saw them on Top of the Pops, I thought they looked great. I thought the record looked really good with them. I thought the whole package made made sort of sense. And and I remember the next morning, Dave Robinson phoned me, phoned me up, and he said, you know, we've just sold 55,000 units. I knew it was going to go mad then, you know, because that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. At which point was the ban? Which point was the band? Well, ban. Ban, when Mike Reed... Oh, the ban was when it was number two. It was because of something Paul Morley put. It was early days with Paul and we we trusted him. <laughs> I mean, you know, he was being, you know, he was being Paul. And he put this whole thing on the 12-inch about lick the shit from my boots. I only saw it when it came out. And I was a little bit... Mm, I wouldn't have put that on the record. And that's what um, Mike Reed read. And he threw the record across the studio and banned it. He couldn't have done us a bigger favour, really. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 talking yeah. of Paul, there's a, there's a lovely way you put it in your book when you talked about the meetings that the three of you would have, you and Jill and him. You said where it's basically good cop, bad cop, insane cop. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so, I, I do want to talk about Owner of a Lonely Heart, obviously, because, again, that was another <coughs> record that we all yeah. went, what? Yeah. I mean, that 
opening drum sample, you know, that just... And the, again, for uh, and, and it was like all of your events. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, oh, yeah. go, you know oh, going, one of which I know is a bit of a g- dig. Going it? from high reverb into zero, you know, totally dry sound, tw- yeah. you know, guitar solos, 12-string guitar solos on Optividers. I mean, it's like an incre- insane record. Uh, but this, yeah. you know, this was a band that I grew and up pop. with. with you know, and yeah. pop. Re- you know. That were much more gentle and ethereal and you were giving them something that was astonishingly rock pop right yeah yeah it was a kind of, I, I think the only reason i managed to convince them was because i'd been in the band you know mm-hmm. and i could i could really uh, dig my heels in because they didn't want to do it it wasn't meant to be for them you know I heard the demo be only because Trevor Raven went to the toilet and left the tape running. Because weren't you listening to on. lots of tracks? And you were yeah, I listened to loads of tracks that he'd written for the uh, for, for them. And I didn't like anything. They were all that kind of, moving in, I'm moving my love into you, you know. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, it's never been love. It's never been something that I've, is interesting. It's not me. very yes either. Not very yes, I would point that out. And then Honor of Lonely Heart came on on this tape. Trevor was in the loo, and I was like, and you know, a lot of the gags that were on the record were on the t- original tape. You know, the uh-huh. big intro, the jump cut to the dry drums. Really? Oh yeah. And the and and the the doodly up, but it was on a mini moog. Doodly up, you know, with a wibble wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they were. It was all like that. And when he came out of the loo, I said, "This is number one record." I said, "Not with this verse. Don't like the verse." But the chorus, it's a hit chorus. And it's, you know, and he was like, no, that's not for yes, yes, can't do that. And sort of from that moment was 10 months of uh, knocking my head against the wall to some degree anyway. Chris didn't want to do it, I take it. No, Chris Chris was okay to do it. It was just getting everybody to get their heads around it because yes, had never played anything as simple as that before. <laughs> and, and and so they kept trying to complicate it, and, and we kept playing it and, and and playing it over and over again. And then finally, I remember we were in the townhouse. I arrived at the townhouse, and there was a deputation waiting for me. And Trevor, we got to talk about Owner of Lonely Heart. We think it's wrong. We don't want to do it. We've wasted days and days on it, and we just don't think it's going to work. And so I was like. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. My whole reputation depends on it. You know, you're going to you're gonna bring me down. Uh, you t- promised me that you'd have a single on this record, and it's got to be this. And I was begging them, please, 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 let me program it on a drum machine. Just let me program it. And, uh, you know, I kept on and on. So finally, because, oh, all right, we'll give it a go. And he and I programmed it on an MPC, and um, Alan White... Was the MPC out then? The MPC, MPC was out, was yeah. Out. It was a very early MPC 60. Right, yeah. And uh, we programmed it on that, and uh, nobody liked it And uh, when we programmed it. But then Alan played the drums on it, and Trevor Rabel was always driving me nuts, talking about Mutt Langer and what a great drum sound Mutt Langer used to get, and, and how it was a big Leopard. snare and the whole bit, and... Yeah. Oh, that was even before Def Leppard. Yeah. So to piss him off, I tuned a snare drop high like Stuart Copeland. <laughs> and, uh, and that high snare drum was an issue from the moment it was done, more or less right to the very end. Because it was very, very old-fashioned sounding, wasn't it? It was like yeah, a, well, a it was, Yeah, donkey. but it, it was high pitched up to an A. But wasn't it, there's one one of your gags in it is a response to one of the lyrics, isn't it? To the Hawk lyrics. Oh, the, yeah, well, you see, I... Uh, the other thing about Ona was it had this terrible verse that I hated. It was so misogynistic, and I won't even sing it to you. And uh, I kept saying, "We've got to do something about that verse." Hence lyrically the, or musically? Lyrically and musically. Hence all the gags. I was thinking as many gags as I can put in to distract you from how shit the verse is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, one day, I, you know, I said to Trevor, "We've got to rewrite this verse. We've got to do it today." We've got to. And he was like, I don't see what you, what's wrong with it. And I was like, it's awful, man. We can't have that first. And we tried everything. We, we, I, I didn't drink at the time, but that night I think I drank. And we were up till about three o'clock in the morning trying different things. And eventually, at a certain point, I said, 
we got to write something that John's going to sing. I've got to be John Anderson. And I started to sing, move yourself, you always live your life. And I wrote the, wrote the whole two verses really fast at three o'clock in the morning. Is Trevor playing guitar along to uh, Well, we had a track. We had the backing oh, right. track with oh, all the right, samples right, right, on it right. and everything, you know. And, uh, and I said, Trevor, you better do the guide vocal. Better not be me, because John won't fucking like it if I'm singing on the track, you know, because he's never forgiven me for being the singer in Yes, even though I was now the producer. And and so um, so Trevor sang the, the guide vocal, and the next day, which was a Friday, we played it to everybody, and they all went... We didn't play it to John, we played it to Chris and uh, Alan. And Chris went, mm, I don't know. And you know, you think, oh, oh. Jesus, man. Are we ever going to sort this track out? It's the democracy of the band. It's yeah, and then on the <laughs> Sunday, he phoned me up and he said, I think he got the tune right. I've just been thinking about it. I think it's right. We should get John to do it. So, of course, the next day, I played to John. And John said, what's this? And I said, it's a new verse in Under the Lonely Heart. I've sung this song. I said, I know, but we've changed it since then. Who's changed it? <laughs> right? <laughs> Who's changed it? <laughs> I said, well, uh, Trevor and me. You? Yeah, me and Trevor have you? changed it. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> he, and I remember, he, I remember he said to me, I wouldn't care if it was fucking sending the clowns or a really good song. He was pretty miserable about it, but I, I was fairly firm. And... Uh, and I got him to sing, I got him to sing the first verse, but he said, I don't like these lyrics on the second verse, and he rewrote most of them. And w he suddenly brought out this white eagle in the sky. And I was like, Gary, where the fuck is the white eagle <laughs> come from? You know? And so when John had gone, <laughs> we put a gunshot in it, we were shooting the white eagle. <laughs> uh, one, this, sorry, one little aside, sorry, just because of, there seems to be a... a couple of little mentions of John's voice um, and his speaking voice. And we want him on the show. We do want him on the show. So <laughs> this... John's, so a, John's a terrific yeah. singer. Oh, no, yeah. it's a No, no, but only... The, the, I, there was this Argentinian tour manager I knew who toured with John when John did a solo <coughs> tour. And apparently... And, and he used to have to call him every morning to tell him about where the car was and everything like that. So they said, the problem is, is the guy, his, his wife was with him and... They both have exactly the same voice, <laughs> and so she and he didn't know what to say when he picked up because he never knew who had picked up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, this all sort of begs the question about who's who do you prefer to to produce a band or a, a singer? Do you? It must. I mean, this, I don't want to preempt your 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 answer. Uh, well, I mean, it's it it obviously it depends on the band. The the problem I have found with bands is it's it's quite hard to work with people w w when you can play a lot better than them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and this particularly applies when I've tried working with young bands. You know, I've I've I remember working with uh, I tried it a few years back. <coughs> you know, a young bass player playing, and me and my engineer both around him deadening the strings in between <laughs> where he's playing because he hasn't got any technique. He just plays and the whole bass rings, you know? That kind of stuff. Bands can be a pain. And ov obviously by the, you know, Murphy's Law, that the guy that gives you the most trouble is the least talented, generally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whereas, you know, when you're working with a singer or just like a vocal group or something, you can hire all the musicians. And when you hire the musicians, everything's fabulous and the birds are singing and everything's nice. Well, I know so because <laughs> having worked with you quite a lot, I mean, it's something I always talk about, and I never know what I'm going to be doing whenever I've come in to work with you. Sometimes it's playing bass. Sometimes it was used to get me to play acoustic guitar quite yeah. a lot. Yeah, and you had this good. great maxim, which I think is probably... Because you had this thing of, like, basically get anyone, literally anyone, to play the acoustic guitar except the guitarist. <laughs> because you know, I remember you once said, "I'll have the guy delivering the pizza do the acoustic guitar before yeah. I." Think. Because the guitarist will go, "Oh, I can give you this, or I can give you this, or I can do this, or how about if I do this?" Yeah. Whereas someone like me is just going to go C, yeah, yeah, G, <laughs> which is what you want. Yeah, right? most of the time, yeah. 
God, yeah. Talking of single artists, I suppose Seal is just, you know, um, your kind of relationship with Seal has been probably the longest out of everyone you've ever worked with, isn't it, Trevor? Yeah, he's put up with me longer than anybody. But do you think, it, is it something to do with, I mean, he's got the most credible voice, but sonically, his voice sits it. And I've, and I've got yeah. been, to, been in your studios <coughs> and, and when you've been working on, on, on some of those on Seal yeah. songs and listen to it, and you can just feel how his voice places within this arrangement arrangement that you create around him so beautifully yeah he's got a great he's got a lovely voice he's one of those guys that that whoever is singing such and such a song he'll probably be able to sing it better <laughs> you know what i mean he can sing anything he does a great sonata he's a great mimic you know it's it's i suppose he he and i have the same sense of humor like very sort of double entendre sense of humor and sometimes if people are talking they'll say something and you know look at each other like did they just really say i can take it up the octave <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> it's a sales really funny and and back in you know when i first started to work with him i said to him look seal you know really i don't mind how many girlfriends you have in the studio but i don't want any male friends if you don't mind and he was like he said no mates only birds <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, well, it's always a... Male friends can really disrupt things. They say stuff like, oh, do you think this is good? Or this sounds a bit lush or something like that and ruin Puts the whole session. Yeah. Or can I play my demo? Yeah, something <laughs> like that, yeah. They're always a bit jealous, whereas girlfriends are generally not jealous unless it's... Well, there's a... There's a I mean, it's an awful thing to admit, uh, but it, it's... In any studio situation, it's like you could almost just tell from the tape when a girl walks in the room. <laughs> yeah. Because everyone's showing off immediately, yeah. aren't they? I mean, it's why, you know, it's, it's why you became a musician, yeah. let's face it. <laughs> Seal used to have some amazing looking girls. Like, um, he had uh, one girlfriend out in LA who was about six foot three and she was in a cop show and she was gorgeous. And, you know, the night that he sang show me on the first album she was sitting at his feet when he was singing it you know uh, and i was working with an american engineer called steve mcmillan who was a very conservative guy he was one of those sort of guys who always says stuff like you know um i do favor the la 76 from 1973 because of the different tube that they use <laughs> he's one of those kind yeah. of guys <laughs> and uh and this girl was there and i said i said to him God, she's a good-looking girl. And he says, it has always been a fantasy of mine to be gang-raped by a group of female police officers. <laughs> <laughs> she could definitely be one of them. Uh, <laughs> when, when, when you're... Um, He's going to be happy with that going out on this, is he? Yeah. <laughs> when you're working... <laughs> Steve... <laughs> You actually named him. There's been a lot of people you haven't yeah. named. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think Steve, I don't think Steve will be bothered by Trevor, that. Uh, Trevor, when, you, when you're working with Seal, how quickly is it before you want the master vocal on there? Is it something that's, that is going to tell you where everything else goes? Well, with him, it's always persuading him to actually sing on the track, you know. You get the track. Hey, see, we've got the track. Mm. He's nervous. Mm, it's okay. Mm. Maybe tomorrow, you know. And I used to stay in the same house as him, and I used to catch him in his suit going out for dinner. So he just come, come on in, come on in, and sing a couple of songs, you know. I, I tried never to organise a an actual session unless it was an emergency, you know. Well, I just catch him on the fly. It was always better. And then he'd come back with a girl maybe at three o'clock in the morning, and he'd be in the mood. Hey, come on, sing these two songs again, you know. And he'd sing them and. You know, I'd, I'd always keep all of them and yeah. keep going through them, you know? Yeah. You once described, I don't know if we can use, I don't want to upset anyone, but because it's one of the most brilliant descriptions I've ever heard and which I've used often. You described them as having a whim of iron. Whims of iron. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I think we were all a lot younger then, you know? <laughs> yeah. And m maybe a few of us had whims of iron. Maybe I was just as bad. <laughs> Your, your latest album, which you're supposed to talk about your latest project, because it's, uh, we've jumped a few decades, sorry. Well, we haven't really, but it, 
it's it's looking back as well, isn't it? And and I've heard the t- few tracks that have been made available, and they they sound fan- absolutely amazing. How do you get about approaching a song that's already been established as a massive hit, and everyone knows it inside out? Well, it's it's it it it's not easy because as you work on the song, sometimes you find yourself thinking, "God, I wish I could do it the way it is on the record," because that's obviously uh, the way you do it, you know. And you can't because you're trying to do some bring something fresh to it. Uh, but I mean, they're all songs. You know what songs are like. You know, you can do all kinds of things with them. I was glad you dragged up the Joe Jackson song because that's been a favourite of mine for yeah. years. That was yeah, a great it's choice. a lovely song, that, yeah. Uh, but I, I was just looking for songs with good lyrics, you know, so lyrics that I liked that meant something, you know, that weren't just idiotic. And, uh, and so all the songs are really chosen from that point of view. It, you know, a song's a song you can do. Back in the day, they, you, you know, a song would become famous and everybody would cut it. You know, Sinatra, mm-hmm. Dean Martin, yeah. everyone would do their versions and different arrangers would change the chords. It's mm-hmm. the same kind of thing, isn't it, really? I mean, if anything, I Nelson Riddle was always very... There was always lots going on in his records, you know what I mean? In between each of the lines, something happened, you know? Yeah. And you still working with Anne Dudley on it? No, I haven't worked with them for a long time. You know, the, the, that was... That was an amazing relationship, though. No, we, we, we had a... I did a lot... Funny enough, in the end, I did some big shows with Anne, you know, where we'd, we'd play on, uh, you know, the, you know, we did a big thing with Robbie at the... You know, when he had his anniversary, we played a 13-minute medley in uh what was it um earl's court oh. and, and it's funny because i mean i remember we were all at the bar at the end of that show and people were talking about who have you got in your in-ears and Anne said huh, i've always got the drums and i've got you you're generally in the right place <laughs> <laughs> i was like Anne. And you paid me a compliment. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, it's one of those. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I, think, I know that you've been asked this a million times. But I, I want to ask if my, my own self-interest in, in, in that who do you regret not producing? Who would you have loved to have done? Uh, just, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I know it sounds absurd, but I wouldn't have mind having a go at Bob Dylan at one point. Yeah. That would have been interesting. Wow. Yeah, just because it's so different from what, from what, you know. And I, I, a friend of mine who's a property developer wrote a song based on, you know, uh, Desolation Row called Desolation New Row. And as a favor for him, I, I did a recording of it. I had a band for another session. And at the end of it, I said to them, we're going to do a version of Demolition, uh, Desolation Row. You guys know it, right? And we did it in one take. With me singing a guide vocal, because I know it so well. I used to be a Bob Dylan. You, 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 yeah, you, could, you do a great yeah. Bob Dylan. You do a great Brian Ferry, in fact, don't you? From yeah. when you did your Top of the Pops <laughs> do, albums. Do a, yeah, I used to sing them on the top. Of the, and, and, and we had such fun, because it was verse after verse after verse. And you knew all the lyrics. I knew all the lyrics, yeah. And you know what it's like when you've got something like that. You have to find something different in each verse. And I thought, God, I would have liked to have done this. You know? Because because he's he's I tell you why. No, but I get it. I get it because, because, Bob, because Bob's a storyteller. Yeah. And you kind of do you, that yes. in your music. That's right? something that does run through your music. Because it is, is the, we said, this cinematic thing, the yeah. storytelling thing. Always come, it comes back to that a lot. To, all right, there's one last thing I want to get on to. Um, because it's one of the, I, I'm sorry, but I think it's one of the greatest pop records of all time. And that was Tattoo. Oh, right. Which was just an insane, but it was Neil Tennant who said that was the, probably the last pop record he held, where it was literally stop whatever you're doing, turn around, yeah. go to the shop, get it and listen to it for 10 hours straight. It, it was amazing. And I remember hearing that and thinking, my God, who did that? And then we're seeing it was you. It's like, well, of course so all the things she uh, All the things she said. It was things she said. Yeah, great and record, why did, great why did nothing else happen with them? Yeah, it's funny though, isn't it? Because yeah. um, no, th- yeah. if I was them, I would have thought <laughs> this works. I heard that in Russian. You see, I heard originally. Oh, come over, oh, you come over, only to ba da, aba da ba da, aba da ba da. Oh, yeah, come over. Oh, yeah. It well, what like are the that. odds? <laughs> it's really, really weird. Russian's got like thirty-one consonants. Um, I, I, 
it was a big hit in Russia. I took it on because um, they had no money, I remember, uh, because they needed the lyric, and I wrote the lyric for it, the English lyric, uh, because you couldn't translate the uh, Russian. The Russian translation was bullshit. It was just like, I love her, yes, 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 I'm hot, I'm hot, I'm hot. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> sexy disco, disco yeah. sexy. Disco sexy, yeah. 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 It was kind of like that. <laughs> and... Uh, and it was one of those things where, where I'd sort of dived into it, um, and I know that I know that before me they tried a couple of other producers and it didn't work out, and so, so, um, I you know when I when I listened to the record I was like, how the hell do you start with something like this? Where am I going to start? In the end, what I did I wrote it, I wrote all the Russian words out phonetically, you know, and then I try you know, and. Any, any, I mean, it, it, it took a while to do because they couldn't speak a word of English. And, you know, the very sort of, you know, the opening line was, I'm in serious shit, I feel totally lost. Oh, shit, I lost. <laughs> you know, it was hours and hours uh, of that kind of thing. And in the end, we... we had you brought them over? Was this a psalm? Yeah, they, brought, they, they came over, yeah. And they were very sweet. Their manager was awful. And he kept getting in the way and... He say things. One time he said, "You know, you're too, you're too kind. You need to be firm with them." And I was like, "Well, you want to do it, mate? You go and have a go." And of course, he goes out, and within five minutes, the pair of them are crying and sobbing, and oh, the whole session finishes. You know, <laughs> I said, "It doesn't work. You just got to be patient. There's no other way." And uh, oh, hour after hour, uh, but in the end, it came good because I had some really good people around me, and. And when you said, why didn't I work with them? I mean, you'd think I would have done because well, you, they, you would, yeah. they sold like 7 million albums off the back of that single. Um, I mean, it was everywhere. But you felt it was the one-off record. You didn't produce the whole album, did no, you? No, I produced two tracks and I played bass on a third track. But then when they came to Because it wasn't about the artist, it was about the record in many ways. It totally was, yeah. Yeah, well, well, it was about the, the record. Yeah, When they came to make a second album... Um, they asked me if I'd do a track, and I said, well, have you got any tracks for me to do? And they said, no. Have you got a track? So I had an old song that we'd had, and I thought, well, I could do that. At least it's a decent song, and they do it. Um, and I met them, and I thought, it's so strange they don't realize that all of this success was because of the effort I, I made on that one <laughs> single. And... They didn't seem to realise it that they just I was just another producer they were doing a track with. Are you, are you going out on tour with this this stuff you're doing now, Trevor? Is that going to? No, I don't think they. I don't, you know, well, not. You couldn't the gather the singers together, probably. No, we'll probably do a show for it. You know. Yeah. Uh, one of the good things about the tattoo record was that the first time I ever heard a, a swung beat put over a straight beat, and that was my engineer Rob Orton. He's mm. doing one more when with I came that in. drum fill. Well, we, it, it, which it, is it, a fantastic it, it, halftime three. Yeah. Well, I'll have to go back and listen now. Yeah. But but we, we, we put a swung drum, drum loop on top of a straight one. It was his idea. It wasn't mine, but I loved it when I heard it, you know. Ah. So it was a funny record. Well, thank you, Trevor. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I think it's been, it, Trevor Horn, amazing yeah. to hear those stories. <laughs> <laughs>